I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures and fame Are never enough That you came along And put me back together now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. If I had to describe GCF in one word, it would be caring. Authentic. Family. Community. GCF in one word. Family. Fun. Belonging. Community. Social. Gracious. Resurrection. Family. GCF is the best family. GCF to me is home. Good morning. Hey, if it's um, Saturday evening at 6 p.m., let me tell you good evening. And if it is Sunday morning at 10 a.m., uh, I want to tell you uh, good morning. Really, uh, whenever the time and whatever the place, we are glad to have you gathered with us uh, for worship in an at-home edition. Uh, here at GCF. Um, as it turns out, there uh, is a wedding this weekend um, at the Adventure Serve campground. Uh, so to leave that space totally available to the happy couple getting married uh, there this weekend, uh, we decided to shift everything uh, online this weekend and let them have that space for all of their festivities and getting their life started together. Uh, there are this morning a few important uh, announcements that I want to let you know about. And the first one uh, involves our eConnect card. We do want you to complete one of those by going to the short link bit.ly uh, bit slash GCF Connect on a device. Uh, this is especially helpful for our faith family uh, when our worship gatherings are virtual. And again, uh, that short link is bit.ly slash GCF Connect. Uh, second thing is this, we are so appreciative for your faithful, generous giving uh, in these days. Uh, and uh, as you think about giving, remember that the easiest ways uh, to do that right now are by text or at the PayPal link at our website, gcfwillmore.org. And the text giving number is 859-279-4212. This Wednesday, uh, we are excited to begin a new Bible study uh, led by GCF's own inimitable, world-renowned New Testament scholar, uh, Craig Keener. Uh, you do need to register for that study of the Gospel of Mark so that we can then send you the Zoom link to log in. So when you complete your eConnect card, you can type in Bible study, uh, and uh, this week, Melanie, our administrator, will get you registered to make sure you have the link uh, to join in with that. Um, if you did not get a chance to see the the video last Thursday with Keith Jones and I, or read my e-note on Friday, I want to encourage you to go back and search through your email or on Facebook for those uh, and take some time to look at an important update about our discussions with uh, Wilmore United Methodist Church regarding our facilities needs and leasing space from them. Hey, one final thing. We are so glad to have so many awesome volunteers who have been helping us make things happen uh, at GCF, especially in regard to media and online worship. Well, to make it a bit easier for, easier for our media volunteers this weekend, who've all gone back to work full-time, uh, the lyrics to the songs have not been added on screen. You can find those lyrics in an email that was sent to you shortly before worship started, if we have you on our email list, or if you're watching at the online.church platform, and we hope that you are, you will find those lyrics in the notes section. Well, Mike and Katie Slatt are going to be leading us in singing today, and then Dylan Ziegler will be bringing us a message uh, from Exodus 13. And uh, I'm going to be back uh, next week preaching as we begin a new message series from the prophet Hosea in the Old Testament called Love Divine. So now, may God anoint you with His Spirit wherever you are, that you may worship Him right now in spirit and in truth. Amen. Hello, GCF. Uh, thank you for joining us here in our living room. I'm Katie, and this is my husband, Mike. And um, our three kids are around. They're supposed to be having quiet time, but who knows if they'll show up or not. So um, we just wanted to take a minute and invite you here with us. Just um, um, bring your kids, bring your distractions, bring your joy, your sorrow, your despair, your loneliness, your hope whatever you're carrying with you today, we just ask, we just invite you to bring it here 
just join with us in worship and just um, let God refresh you and let this community build you and just just stand here with us and just worship a little bit. So thank you for joining us and we hope that um, you are blessed by the music and by uh, the words and just by God himself today. Chance
sense that, that we had was that for some people, these words might be difficult to sing and kind of feel like you mean it. We just came off a couple weeks of uh, talking about loneliness uh, in a sermon uh, series, and and we, we, we might understand things mentally, but maybe we don't feel it, maybe we haven't experienced it, that, that we haven't been left alone by God, or, and so I just want to, we want to take a moment to just honor that, that if that is your experience, we are glad that you're here, and we're going to take a moment, uh, we're going to sing this bridge again, but we're going to take a moment to, um, just ask the Lord to come and visit and help us to experience the things that we know to be true. Um, and we just, uh, and so I'm going to pray right now, God, that you would come. You would come and be with each of us who are worshiping now together. And uh, just thank you, God, that you are faithful. So we give this moment to you pray that you would meet us. Thank you. 
Hello everyone, my name is Dylan Ziegler and I am one of the young adult leaders here at GCF. It is always a joy to be able to share with you what God is teaching me in my life um, and be able to just present that to you as hopefully a word from God for your life as well. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, on our online service. You can join any church in the world at this point. Uh, so the fact that you chose to join our faith family means a lot. And so thank you for joining in with us this morning. I hope that I hope that this word can be beneficial for you. Now, I know that we are doing all online services this week. So I want to encourage you and even challenge you to, to overpost in the chat. So I'm talking like a, a grandma on Facebook with seven comments on one picture. I want to challenge you to overpost uh, in an attempt to help better create a, a sense of community, help better create a sense of this being our worshiping community this morning. So please feel free to, to post some comments in the chat. Um, if I say anything that, that God um, brings out and highlights to you, just feel free to, to write that in the chat and share it with everyone else. This morning I want to talk about worship. I want to talk about worship and experiencing the presence of God in the midst of what is probably one of the biggest moments of transition we've ever faced as a faith family. I do want to speak to our moment of transition because not only are we at GCF dealing with the ramifications of COVID and all of the challenges that that brings with it, but we're also doing that without a permanent building. We're doing it in the middle of a, a building transition. So some of the challenges that other churches have had to face have been exaggerated because we don't even have a permanent space to modify to fit all the restrictions that they want to put in place. So what was already a period of tremendous change has been even more disorienting and even more frustrating than it would have been otherwise, not least of all for our pastors, for our elders, for our volunteers, and all the people that have had to work countless hours to put together these online worship services um, and maintain the, the type of quality that they have. I've been able to visit a couple other churches over the last couple months and observe what they're doing for uh, services. And yeah, what, what we have been able to do at GCF, we've been blessed to the point of being spoiled by... Um, the services that we've had and by what the pastors and elders and volunteers have been able to do to create a semblance of normalcy, to create a sense of stability in such a tumultuous time. So when I say that worship is different now than it was six months ago, uh, please don't take that as an indictment against the worship services that we are doing. It's just saying, I'm, I just want to recognize that worship looks different now than it does and than it did six months ago. Now, in a recent article, Andy Crouch, who's a popular Christian author, shared some reflections on the pandemic. He shared how it has affected churches and how it will continue to affect churches. He says that we need to think of this transition period not just as a blizzard or a winter, but more like an ice age. Now, what does he mean by that? A blizzard is a really short period, intense crisis. To get through a blizzard, is to survive. You just need to take shelter and focus on your survival. And you don't need to worry about um, making something a sustainable pattern for a long period of time. You just need to do something that you can put up with for two or three days. You just need to worry about responding to the immediate danger. Now winter is a little bit different. Winter lasts a couple months. Getting through a winter may require you to adjust how you get around the world and how you get the things you need, your basic needs. Uh, you might be able to hide and cover for a day or two, but you're going to need to be a little bit more sustainable if you want to make it through a whole winter. Now, Crouch says that these two um, are a little bit more shorter term, but I mean, going on our sixth month with pandemic restrictions, I think it's 
obvious that the pandemic is closer to an ice age, which is on a scale of years and drastically changes the entire landscape. If a species wants to make it through an ice age, they need to adapt to their new environment. They need to find new sustainable ways of getting food and getting water and creating shelter. Their former sources of food might be gone entirely and they're gonna to have to locate new sources of sustenance. Now, the type of transition we are facing is closer to a winter or an ice age than it is to a blizzard. The pandemic has drastically changed our worshiping landscape and we're gonna to need to adapt to learn how we're gonna find new sources of spiritual sustenance. I'm preaching this message mostly at myself. Like I said, this is something that God has been teaching me over the last couple weeks. I've started to realize that at least for me, and I'm just trusting that there are others out there like me, that I rely so heavily that I'm almost dependent on a comfy Sunday morning service in that 300 building to feel like I'm being spiritually sustained, to, be, to feel like I'm being spiritually fed. Without realizing it, I came to be dependent on an air-conditioned building uh, and a comfy chair and a Panera pastry in my hand uh, to consider, to have what I considered a pure worship experience. If I can't just close my eyes and lose myself in worship, uh, if I'm not completely undistracted, then I feel like I can't worship. And I think that's a problem for me. Of course, it's pretty difficult when we're at the tabernacle to forget the 95 degree humidity or the nice mouth sweat that I have under my mask when I'm trying to sing Wounded One at the top of my lungs. It's hard to go undistracted. And especially when we're at home online, there may be kids running around, there may be dishes in the sink, we may be making breakfast during service. I'm not confessing to anything, Pastor Jason. Uh, but there are distractions around. So in light of our new environment, our new worship landscape, how are we going to continue to receive spiritual sustenance without our normal worship? This morning we're going to look at a passage from Exodus as a point of reflection on a community of faith in transition to see how they responded to that transition and how God responded to them. We're going to be looking at Exodus 16, Verses 1 through 4, mostly. First, we're going to read verses 1 through 2. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So some of you may know that Israel started out as a small family who fled their homeland to escape a famine. And they ended up living in Egypt for about 400 years, the Bible says. Eventually, they were enslaved there by a pharaoh who was not quite as kind to the Israelites. And they were forced into slave labor. And they lived this life, they lived this, this pattern of, of this lifestyle for about 400 years. 400 years is a long time. America is 273 years old. It's like twice as old as America. 400 years is a long time to be in a certain pattern of life, to be going through the same routines. That's a lot of generations of passed down knowledge about how to find your basic needs. You know, they knew how to go to the market and trade for the food that they needed. They knew how to find the, the part of the Nile River Bank where they could go get water. And they knew how to build little mud huts from the simple materials that they had around them. They were familiar with a very particular way of life. Now, usually when we read this about the Israelites complaining and whining to Moses and Aaron, we tend to judge them. We tend to say that they, they shouldn't be whining. They were headed to the promised land from slavery. They, shouldn't, they should be grateful, if anything. But this morning, I want to argue for a more sympathetic reading of this passage. Um, I think that we can reread this in a new light. Sure, they should not have grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They were simply following God's instructions. But, you know, in some real sense, the Israelites 
were going through a difficult transition. I think that they were justified in not necessarily grumbling, but mourning a certain way of life. Behind all the barbed comments that they were likely saying to Moses and Aaron were people who were just facing uncertainty. And they were mourning the loss of a familiar way of life. Now, Marilyn Elliott, some of you may know her, the former director of community formation, I think, at the seminary, used to give what was called the transition talk. And it was well beloved by most people at the seminary. In that talk, she said that even if you're going somewhere infinitely better than where you're at now, the fear of uncertainty can sometimes overwhelm the fear of staying where you're at. So even if you're headed to the promised land as an Israelite, the fear of the unknown, the uncertainty that's involved in transition um, can overwhelm the anticipation of that better thing that's coming in the future. Even if they're headed to this land flowing with milk and honey, that doesn't diminish the fact that the uncertainty was great and that the transition was hard. And I think God understood their fears as well. Uh, of course, he says you're grumbling against Moses and Aaron. That means you're grumbling against me as well and um, kind of rebukes them for part of that. But I think that God does understand that there was some very real and very justified fear underneath those barbed comments, underneath those complaints. In verses 9 and 10, it says, Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. Now, if we read this in a sympathetic light, and we replace grumbling with mourning, which grumbling may have just have been a symptom of a deeper, um, a deeper mourning, if we read that, it'll say, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your mourning. It's eerily similar to what it writes earlier in Exodus when God brought them out of Egypt, where he heard the cries of his people. God hears the cries of his people and his presence comes near them. The Israelites had left their normal way of life and they were leaving for a whole new world. They had no idea how long it would last. And they probably longed for the times when they knew what tomorrow was going to look like. Of course, we're in a pretty similar situation. We've left our normal worship atmosphere. And it doesn't look like we're going to go back to that anytime soon. We've left our typical environment. We've left our preferred ways of worshiping together. Just like the Israelites wondered where they would find their physical sustenance, a lot of us are wondering how we're going to be spiritually fed. Services look different. Community groups look different. Prayer ministry looks different. Children's ministry looks very different. Nothing seems the same anymore. How are we supposed to be fed each week? They longed for a way of life that they had left, as terrible as it may have been, as they faced the uncertain desert. In a real sense, I think that we too, uh, as we go through this transition, are are justified in mourning some things that we're going to be leaving behind. I don't think that that can overwhelm the anticipation of the good things that are coming in the future, because it sounds like we have some really exciting things in the works. But I want to recognize that a lot of us have been struggling to maybe articulate that we do need to mourn a season of, of life of our faith community that is in the past now. Uh, a certain way of doing things that may not come back anytime soon. Um, even once we're in <clears throat> the UMC building, um, we're still probably going to be masked. We're still probably going to be socially distant. It's hard to tell when the next time we'll be able to lay hands on one another in prayer is. And so in some way, we do need to mourn the loss of these ways of worship. Uh, and, and God hears that mourning. God hears those cries and understands. In verse 3, it says, The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. The main concern 
of the Israelites was their physical sustenance, their, their food. Whether they were misremembering their enslavement in Egypt or whether they actually had all the food they wanted, this seems to be their, their biggest concern. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the arrangement was with these pots of meat, but it doesn't sound very appealing to me. This seems to be their main fear, though. How are they going to get their next meal? And so far, I've been referring to worship as spiritual sustenance. I'm kind of comparing it to food. Um, you eat it and you get filled. Already, I can feel some people begin to get uncomfortable with that, with that analogy. And they have a good, they will likely have a good argument against it. They'll say, doesn't this uh, view of worship, isn't it kind of self-centered? Um, where it gives into the consumerism where worship is something that feeds me. Uh, it's about my self-fulfillment. Does that not just forget the idea that worship is supposed to be giving worth or praise to God? Giving praise and adoration to God. We're supposed to be giving, not necessarily receiving. This is a good point, and and we should hear it, honestly. But I think to insist that we don't get anything from worship, from fully embodied worship, uh, is a bit misguided. I think that there is a very real spiritual renewal that happens when we genuinely and earnestly worship God. Worship, I think, is a both and. It's a giving and a receiving. We give praise and adoration and we receive the Spirit of God in our worship. At least this is, what's, this is what some worship theologians will say. They point out that worship is like a meeting with God. All of it is designed to facilitate this meeting with God and this conversation with God where we sing praise and he speaks to us through the word. And a conversation should never be one-sided because they're always awkward when they're one-sided. Spirit or Worship needs to be a two-sided conversation. We need to give and we need to receive. And so in this way, we really do need worship as a form of spiritual sustenance. We need it for our ongoing spiritual health. But this begs the question that I've been getting at. What happens when our normal ways of worship, our normal means of worship, are interrupted? I think we can find the answer in the last verse, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, manna. The people are to go out every day and gather just enough for that day. The Israelites were not supposed to stop into these huge pots of meat and take all the food they wanted for the whole week. Again, I'm not sure exactly how the pots of meat worked, uh, but it, they had some arrangement with these pots of meat, it seems. God says that he's going to provide manna day by day. God's going to provide just enough to get by for that day. So day by day, they're going to need to trust that God will provide enough for them in this form of these tiny little wafers. Now, our normal ways of life in the church seem to have been interrupted. Uh, we're in a new landscape. We're in this COVID ice age, right? And we have to figure out what it looks like to spiritually sustain ourselves over a long period of time without what has been, for a lot of us, the main staple of our, the main food source for us, the main staple and I think that's where the problem lies, is relying too much on our Sunday services for all of our spiritual sustenance, for all of our spiritual renewal. I think we need to diversify our food sources. Worship looks different for a while. Even once we have a building, like I said, we're going to be socially distant, we're going to be masked, we're going to be panera -less. Even once we're in the UMC building, we're still going to need a diversity of food sources for our spiritual renewal. So where do we find them? I think that the key to surviving our current winter is to reclaim the Christian view of all of life as worship. Not just Sunday morning, not just the 300 building. Sunday has traditionally only been one of the expressions of Christian worship. Christianity doesn't believe that the presence of God is localized, that it's stuck in the 300 building, and unless we get back there, we can't get topped up for the week with our spiritual uh, fulfillment. No, we believe that in Jesus' death and resurrection, the, the temple to the curtain, <laughs> the curtain to the temple was torn, and the presence of God that they understood to be in the ark, in the holy of holies, was unleashed on the world, and it invades every square inch 
of the world that we inhabit, pandemic or not. If we want to, thri- if we want to thrive, not just survive, <clears throat> in a prolonged transition that's way closer to a winter or an ice age, we need to learn how to find spiritual sustenance in every activity of life, not just worship services on Sunday morning. As Christians, we need to reclaim the idea that we can worship God in making the bed, writing a financial report, or making dinner just as much as we can singing Wounded One at the top of our lungs. We can witness to the glory of God in meeting a friend for lunch, working for a boss that we don't respect, or changing a blowout diaper, which I'm told is a thing. My problem is that I tend to think of spiritual food as a well-done Sunday service. Worship for me, and I think for some of us, became hearing an excellent worship set by Ronjo and an expertly written sermon by Jason. That was the extent of my view of worship. Worship ended after that benediction on Sunday morning. In reality, though, every part of life, every daily routine, every humdrum activity that we involve ourselves in, is a possible form of worship. <clears throat> Tish, uh, Tish Harrison War, Tish Harrison Warren, I believe is her name, um, wrote a book called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. And it was a book recommended to me by Aletha Clements, actually, when I was talking about writing the sermon. And so I read it in this past week. It was a really, really good book. In that book, she compares a lot of parts of our ordinary life to parts of our worship service and parts of um, the Christian life in general. She says losing keys, losing your car keys, can be a chance to practice confession and humility. Arguing with a spouse can be an opportunity to work on peacemaking and seeking shalom. Sitting in traffic is a lesson in patience and a lesson in trusting in God's timing. Every boring, mundane part of our lives is pregnant with the possibility of being lifted up to God if we live it faithfully for Him. When something interrupts our normal channel of spiritual food, we begin to feel starved. But if we can start to see every activity, every part of our daily lives, as an opportunity to worship, we can survive any winter because we constantly have Sources of spiritual sustenance. Every part of life can sustain us. In the 17th century, there was a relatively unknown French peasant uh, by the name of Nicholas Herman. He had served in the army during the Thirty Years' War, where he witnessed terrible atrocities and even suffered a crippling wound himself. He spent the rest of his life disabled and decided to dedicate himself to a Carmelite monastery, where he took on the name that most of us will recognize him by, brother Lawrence. There he was assigned the task of being a cook and a dishwasher, and originally he hated his assignment. In his book, uh, Practicing the Presence of God, it says that he had naturally a great aversion to his job as a cook in this monastery, and he would pine for the times when he could escape his kitchen and go to the cathedral and, and run to God in prayer, in retreat, and escape from his life in the kitchen. Over time, though, Brother Lawrence developed what he called the practice of the presence of God. In this, he began to open his eyes to the presence of God's grace in every area of his life, including the pots and pans he was using in his kitchen. He became so engrossed in developing this continual worship, this continual awareness of God's presence, Uh, that it was eventually written about him that with him the set times of prayer were not different than any other times. That when he retired to pray, according to the directions of his superior, uh, that he did do that, but that he didn't want to. He went off to pray in the cathedral like he was supposed to as a monk, but that he didn't want to anymore, nor did he ask for it, because his greatest busyness did not divert him from God. What Brother Lawrence discovered is that God's grace is just as present in washing his dishes as in singing Amazing Grace. We might not always see it, we might not always feel it, 
But if we ask God to renew our minds, to reframe our reality, we can be given eyes to see and ears to hear his presence in everyday, ordinary life. What I think Brother Lawrence discovered is that dedicated worship times are not so much to recharge our spiritual batteries as we think of it so often. They're to renew our minds to receive the grace of God in the week ahead. So I have two words here, recharge and renew. Recharging or refueling means that you're depleted. Your fuel gauge is on E, you're empty, and you can't get any more unless you get back there on Sunday morning. Sunday worship is like a spiritual gas station or charging station. When you're out of spirit, you can't get any more spirit unless you go to a pew on a Sunday morning. The problem with this view is that God's people are never without his Holy Spirit. We are never without the presence of God, and his grace is always abundant for us. Renewing, on the other hand, means letting the library know that you're going to keep the book you already have. You already have the Spirit. We renew our minds at worship service because the Spirit of God is already alive and well in us. We just need a reminder to keep our eyes open for Him throughout the week in our ordinary life. The divine isn't just there on Sunday service. The divine is in the daily. Christian worship is the Christian walk. It's the Christian way of life. It's not doing something above and beyond, doing something extraneous on Sunday morning. It's doing everything that you would normally do as a human with a Christian mindset, with a renewed mind to see God in all of it. If we can train our minds to recognize the presence of God in everything that we do, we can learn to survive any restriction COVID can throw at us. We can survive any building transition. Because we don't rely just on the Sunday service to experience God. We experience God in everything that we do. Now, I want to close with just a brief analogy. This past summer, my mother was <laughs> sleeping in a hammock behind our home in western Pennsylvania. And she felt a cold, wet nose nudge her arm. And she assumed that maybe it was a neighbor dog or something like that. And she opened her eyes to her surprise to see a young deer, a young male deer, a little buck with budding antlers standing over her. Now, deer, I'm sure most of you are aware, are usually pretty skittish creatures. They're usually pretty afraid of human beings, but this deer wasn't. He was a little bit overly friendly. At first they were worried he might be rabid or something, but he survived for weeks and he actually spent most of this past summer in the neighborhood where my parents live. The neighbors gave him water out of the watering hose. They let him graze in the yard. Uh, they basically adopted him as a member of their neighborhood. And they named him Bucky George. Now, Bucky George uh, had no fear of humans, and they couldn't figure out why. And a deer farmer friend, they, they asked him about it, and he said that no wild deer would ever be this fearless. Um, without being rabid, and he didn't seem to be rabid or um, dangerous in any way. The farmer told them that what was most likely is that he had been bottle-fed and raised on a deer farm and then released later in life. The problem is that Bucky George had never learned how to find food on his own, and so he became overly dependent on humans for his food. As soon as anyone new came to my parents' house and saw this arrangement, uh, where Bucky George was just hanging out in their yard with them or sitting by the fire, um, the first thing that anybody said, you can probably guess it, Bucky George isn't going to make the winter. Bucky George doesn't have the tools that he needs. He doesn't have the know-how, the, the ability to adapt to make it through a long winter. He came to rely solely on being fed by humans to survive, and as soon as his situation changed, as soon as he was sent out into the wilderness, uh, he doesn't, he's not going to know how to find berries in a snow-covered forest, and he's not going to know that under that sheet of ice is actually a stream that has the water that he's going to need. He's not going to make the winter. What about us? We're in for a winter-length transition season, or more, maybe closer to an ice age. What are going to be our new sources of sustenance? 
Do we know how to find them? Where will you push the snow aside in your daily routine and find God's grace in somewhere that you didn't expect? Where are you going to crack the ice and look underneath to find God's grace flowing abundantly in your workplace? An overly domesticated and dependent church is not going to survive this new environment. In fact, a lot of churches are not surviving this new environment. But an adaptive body of believers who can renew their minds weekly to find God's grace in ever new ways in everyday life, ordinary life, the humdrum routine that we all go through, if we can learn to find God's grace in these small things, we can thrive in any environment where God sends us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, we thank you for this transition, actually. We thank you that through this, you're opening our eyes to the ways that we've become overly dependent on a slick service, a well-produced music, or an expertly written sermon. And don't look for you in our everyday lives enough. Thank you for pointing out the ways in which we aren't ready to survive the winter, but the ways in which you're providing for us day by day, giving us our daily bread just enough to get through. If we're willing to have eyes to see and ears to hear you in everything that we're doing, in every activity, I pray that you do this for us this week, that we see you ever more, and that we receive your grace gratefully thankfully, recognizing that you hear our cries, that you see us mourning a way of life that may just be lost. But trusting in you that there is a promised land, that there is a better future that you are taking us to as a faith community. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, guys. Wow, thanks, Dylan. Hey, we're going to respond to that word by singing, Lord, I need you. And I want to encourage you as we do this, whatever God was saying to you, whatever he was putting on your heart, would you take that and um, use the song and the space just to surrender it to him?
not stand up for what you Jesus, you're my whole mainstay. So teach my song, sing it to him. Teach my song to rise to you. Hey, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for worshiping with, worshiping with us. Don't forget, if God was doing something in your heart during worship, you would like prayer, you're welcome to connect with us. You connect at the links that we just dropped. Um, look forward to seeing you soon. God bless.